All right, we're going to get started here. Uh, this presentation is in, in, entitled My Encaustic Life, and I'd like to welcome all of you from around the world. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it, and um, I love that you all have such passion for this amazing medium. I love encaustic painting. A lot of you know um, me only as like cold wax painting or acrylic painting, mixed media. Uh, however, I, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about my story and my history because encaustic has played such an important part in my artistic life. Also at the very end of this presentation is a special early bird offer. At the end, I kind of like hinted at it in the emails to you guys. And I said, hey, you know, you wanna be on this call, don't miss it because you have to be there to kind of um, to hear about my special. And um, I'm very excited to tell you all about it. But first I want to kind of lay the groundwork for what um, I'll be talking about at the very end of the call. So. Um, it all began, as far as encaustic goes, when I lived at 493 Roaring Line Road. Uh, at that time, uh, we lived in the woods, and um, we had kind of an old house, and we had like a lot of little funny areas. And this happened to be where I got started with encaustic. It was a attached garage, but it was really like a storage area, area. not where we parked our cars, but it was like this, I don't know, you'll see other images, but it was a very narrow area. So in 2008, I set up to work in encaustic in our attached garage. Now, at first I used a box fan for ventilation and um, here's a box fan. Just, I'm sure a lot of you have a box fan, but all you need to do is like have a window that slides open or that you raise and you can put a box fan there. Now that just allows you to keep your, uh, your area ventilated. And uh, for those of you who um, are completely new to encaustic, let me just explain really quickly. The word encaustic means burning in. Here's my propane torch and I've got a little butane torch here as well. Sometimes I have a heating gun uh, and there are some safety precautions, but not a lot. One of them would be that you wanna have a safe space with ventilation. So whether that's an open window, an open door, um, you can go a little bit more than that and have fancy ventilation, but I will stress that safety is always important. Um, protect your health. Um, notice all the heated implements here, pancake griddles, electric frying pans. Well, I got these things at a thrift store and I thought that was pretty cool because there aren't many mediums you can get started with by going to the thrift store. But um, when it comes to mark making, when it comes to the pancake griddles, um, these little containers here are used pet food cans or tuna cans. So um, this is where I got started. Here's another shot of like some other materials. And I, I used cheap chip brushes. They're pictured right here. So if you go to any hardware store and go to the paint section, you know, these brushes are like a dollar each. They're really inexpensive. I would say that of all my encaustic brushes, I have mostly um, these chip brushes because you know you kind of have one for each color. Now um, I also have these large hockey brushes. These are special in that they have um, natural bristles, but notice the width. If you start to work larger, as I've kind of talked on my YouTube channel, well, when you work larger, your equipment has to get larger as well. But many things again I got from the thrift store. Um, oil paints can be used to make your own colors and used pet cans can hold your paints. And I did organize my handmade waxes in plastic drawers and I labeled them over here. This is my older studio. Um, here, this drawer shows the pet cans. Um, these are cat food cans. Um, here's another view. This kind of shows how narrow, I know that a lot of us are limited by space and we might think, you know, gosh, can I work in encaustic? Do I have enough space? Yes, you can. Um, this was so tight. Um, if I, I mean, I literally had to like sometimes go through here sideways because it was hard for me to get around. But all you need to do is have a table and then put your supplies on like some sort of a table beside it. I happen to have a lot of carts on wheels and then have some ventilation and you're pretty good to go. Uh, this up here shows my dry pigment collection. In the early days, I, you know, I, I made my own encaustic waxes. Um, so I collected dry pigments from Sinopia, Kama, Douglas and Sturgis, and I have a whole list, a whole PDF of like all of where I get all my supplies because I don't want to have to dig up this information again and again. Here are some handmade or homemade um, encaustic uh, paints, some of the little bit of cooking that I actually do. <laughs> I just ask my family. <laughs> um, okay, 
So my very first encaustics, um, I did them in 2008. That's when I took a workshop from Shauna Moore. Um, and the reason I took the workshop from her was because I had gone up to, I think it was um, uh, Whitefish. I went to a gallery and I saw an encaustic and it just blew me away. I, I, I had to ask the gallery owner like, okay, what is this medium? I've never seen it before. And I was just like, I couldn't get enough of it. Um, so for those of you who, I mean, I'm assuming that all of you have like seen an encaustic, but for those of you who may not have seen the uh, surface of an encaustic, um, hard to kind of describe, but it's lustrous. It can be super smooth. It can be bumpy. But the thing about it is that when you shine it or buff it with a cloth, um, the sheen cannot be beat. I just don't think that there's another medium out there that can come anywhere really close to um, the uh, effect or surface quality of an encaustic painting. And I just wanted to explain that um, because I was new and I hadn't even taken any classes yet or anything, I did get the book by um, Joanna Matera, um, the encaustic medium, but uh, I used stencils and graphite for this painting and this painting. And I didn't know anything. All I did was I glued a piece of paper onto a piece of wood. I had graphite powder and stencils. Here's the stencil. Um, the Katagama stencils are used in making kimono patterns. And I, um, after I finished the drawing, I then coated it with beeswax. I buffed it and pretty much that was it. Um, did a few other things, but uh, that shows you how quickly it can work. Um, and then I, around that time, I, the Missoulian, which is a local newspaper, came to visit my studio because I was going to be showing my work at Radius Gallery in Missoula, and they were curious, what is encaustic? So they came to my studio, <laughs> and they really got a lesson because they had no idea that anyone would paint with molten wax and propane, and um, plus the mess I was making, which, you know, that's me, but um, I think they were quite entertained. So um, that's a, a picture of me back then. Uh, okay, then uh, I started grad school in 2008 also. So the coincidence between starting in caustic and going to grad school, they kind of collided. And in caustic became such an important media uh, for me to work with. So these in caustic paintings were done. Um, this one's called Earth and Sky. Again, there's a graphite drawing and ink kind of, you know, some drawings as an under uh, drawing. And then this over here, um, you'd be kind of surprised because it looks really complex, but you can actually incorporate digital printouts with encaustic. So those of you who do photography, it's the same thing. You can incorporate photography into an encaustic painting. And I've worked with students who, who love to do that. And, you know, like Leslie loves to do things like that. She was talking about all the things that she does. So once I did the printout, I then incised lines and filled them with, you know, various things like oil paints. So those oil paints that you might have, they can be used in encaustic. And this is a digital printout. I designed this and then I have a collage uh, piece of paper here and um, just another example of another technique. And these two pieces are in the permanent collection of the Mo uh, Montana Museum of Art and Culture in, at the University of Montana. Um, now moving on, this is now 2011. Um, the ability to evoke emotion was easier for me in this medium. Now, I, I think part of that has to do with the immediacy of this medium. So think about it. You're not waiting for paint to cool. You're waiting for paint. I'm sorry, you're not waiting for paint to dry. You're waiting for paint to cool. You're muted. Thank you. Thank you very much. If any of you can let me know when I'm muted, I'd appreciate it. So um, I'm not sure where I left off exactly, but um, the ability to evoke emotion was easier in this medium. And I think this may be due to the immediacy of this medium. Sorrow, which is this painting right here, is actually in my studio right now. And the reason I have it right now, I, I've never wanted to sell it. It's one of my favorite paintings um, over my 30 year um, 30 years of being an artist, I would say this is like one of my top paintings. And I'm sure you're saying why, <laughs> but um, the reason for me is that the, the amount of emotion I feel when I look at this painting, um, I feel it as strongly as when I first painted it. And that's kind of what I'm looking for in my own work. Um, and this painting was shown at the Holter Museum of Art in 2011. 
So um, for me, a lot of you know that I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by mark making and I love shapes and, and who doesn't love color. So I'm sure that a lot of you would like these same things. I had to find my way and caustic is a very unique medium. Rather than wait for paint to dry, you wait for wax to cool. And this happens very quickly. Being impatient, maybe this is one reason I love this medium. Encaustic relies on concealing and revealing and surprises are around every single corner. I think with this medium for me, um, you know, we all know the feeling of opening a gift on Christmas morning, right? When we were really small or opening up a kiln and, and bringing out the ceramics that you just glazed and you have no idea how the glazes will come out. I don't know, this medium for me is, is that way. Um, they are all, all, all are kind of that way when you um, re conceal and reveal, but there's something about the immediacy again of encaustic that, I don't know, it, it just really hooked me. Um, as I explored this medium, the more I learned about special tools. Now these are not anything that you must have, of course, but um, I love smooth surfaces. So I learned how to get a super smooth encaustic surface. And I used a snowboard um, heater like this. Uh, other times I had like a temperature regulator and I used this jaunting tool. Um, and jaunting tools are used in batik. So imagine, you know, any batik you've seen with the precise little dots and lines, a tool like this was used, but I can tell you that the people who made those things in Bali did not have probably an electric shunting tool. So this is kind of a special thing. Um, I jumbo sized my propane tank because it was easier for me to hold the hose than hold up the propane tank uh, for long hours. Uh, as far as what you paint on, you know, the, the beauty of this is that you can paint on a cradle panel, a flat panel, masonite, Baltic birch, illustration board, multimedia artboard, um, ampersand panels, and you can even, you know, if you decide to go the encaustic monotype route, you can uh, actually work on rice paper. And that's pretty amazing. So I, I did, I, I also do encaustic monoprints and I've even incorporated them into encaustic work. And that's been a lot of fun. Moving along, this is now 2013. And on the left-hand side, I wanted to point out that this is a technique called accretion, where, you know, like I said, the wax is cooling on your brush. Well, if you, um, if, you, if you brush across the surface of your panel as that paint is starting to cool, well, the wax is gonna build up and it's gonna get kind of um, a certain texture. You still have to heat it in. You always have to heat in every single layer, but uh, this particular technique is what I learned here. This one is when you kind of hit it with your propane torch or your heat gun and you start to see the wax kind of swirling around. You can imagine what that's like. It's a bit like when you marble fabric, that's kind of what happens. And you see the wax moving in front of your eyes. Now, sometimes that means you're overheating it, but it can lead to some very interesting effects. Um, and for every encaustic artist, it's different what they're going for, right? Like what I'm going for might be totally different from everybody else. Some mark making tools that I use. Uh, mark making is very important to me in this medium. It's probably one of the first times I realized just how important it was because I had a hard time getting it. So when I realized how hard it was for me to make marks, it was frustrating. And I spent a lot of time, like, what can I do to get these marks that I want? Because you know, when you see me on YouTube, I'm, I'm like getting these crazy things. But on the encaustic surface, I wasn't sure how I was gonna do that. Well, I eventually found that if I use things like Sorel transfer paper, pan pastels, Caron Neo Neocolor 2s, which are water soluble, but they're wax-based, Stabilo Woody pencils. And, and a lot of you have these. And the reason you have them is because these are mixed media um, sort of items here. You can use them in acrylic, you can use them in cold wax, and you can use them if you work on encaustic. And I think that's the beauty of it too. Like once you start to have a certain number of things, you can find that you can get um, similar effects in different mediums. So these are close-ups of a four by six foot painting that um, I did and, and I, I really had a lot of mark making. So these are the tools I used. Uh, more items that are very typical in a, any encaustic studio would be gloves, um, either nitro gloves or you know, heavy duty gloves. Like if you're making your own encaustic medium, you might wanna have a pair of those. Scraper uh, to clean off your surface. Here is a, uh, a, a laser thermometer, um, which I love, in, infrared. Um, this is probably one of my favorite items right here. 
I'm not sure if it's the same kind that they're using for COVID, like when they're, they, sh- they pointed at your forehead, but cause I don't want to point it at my forehead. <laughs> There's something about a laser beam that I just don't want to do that. But anyways, it's great for like getting the temperature, the exact temperature of a hot mixture. These are silicone molds and I make my own encaustic medium. Just pop them out of these little silicone molds and you can get like the bread shape or the cupcake shape or whatever you want. This over here, if, if I showed you the number of items I've picked up over time, um, seashells, and then I've gone to like the thrift store, I've found uh, bullet shells or casings, I found a cheese grater, a chain, um, you know, wire. Uh, the thing about wax um, that I didn't mention is that when it's at a certain um, warmth, it's, it's warm, you've just heated it, the slightest touch, you could put fingerprints on there, dust it with graphite, and it would look like, you know, all those fingerprints would actually be there. It's that sensitive. So this is a very sensitive um, surface at a certain point. Now, when it cools and gets hard, not so much, but when it's warm, absolutely. A few important discoveries led to a whole new way to make marks for me. I discovered new ways to make unusual shapes and marks, and this is a huge game changer for me. When I started to realize what I could do with this medium, there was no turning back. Um, I guess that's why I'm so excited because the the longer I work with this medium, it's all additive information, right? You learn this and you learn that, and they're like little building blocks. Like you know, and 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 the more you work at something, you've all found that with the mediums that you love and. Um, I'm taking you through this journey because you can probably see that my work is changing over time. Um, you're seeing new techniques that are tried. You're seeing maybe more definitive shapes. You're seeing lines, you're seeing dots, you know, that was not so much in the earlier work. And that's, that's a pretty big change. In 2015, mixing and caustic with other mediums opened a whole new world for me. I was able to adjust value. Value is how light or dark your colors are. So this is a dark value um, and this is a lighter value. This painting was not that way um, until I started to use mixed media. Um, And I just like made this painting conform to what I wanted. And when I did that with my mixed media, I was like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe it because this is what I wanted. So um, very exciting time. These two pieces are now, um, they were part of like a, you know, at a university, they've got these percent for art um calls and you can submit work and then they usually want them for some building on campus well these two got into the chemistry building this one's called chem 101 and this one's called osmosis uh in 2016 i began to scale up to you know larger sizes but um these are actually close-ups of all different sizes of work just to show you like the the amounts of detail um some techniques Um, And then this would be the other side of our garage. So it wasn't enough for me to take like one side of the garage. I had to take the other side, which is where the cars go. So notice there's not a car here. Instead, this is my um, Roland hot box. And here are my homemade uh, monotype waxes. And this is a monotype. It's done on rice paper. And this was yet, so it it wasn't enough for me to take um, over both sides of the garage. I then eventually, like a virus, um, took over one of our bedrooms. And this is like where I did framing. And like, I was very fortunate that my family, like they knew there was no stopping me. And I I literally was starting to like creep and crawl over other rooms in the house and take over. And this was yet another room. This is my third studio here. Um, but I had to keep the framing studio very clean because, you know, no cat hairs, no pet hairs, nothing, or, you know, your framing would be ruined. But then, um, this is the end of July. Um, I was actually, this is our house right here on Roaring Lion Road. And these are the big windows facing the, this road down here. And I was on the other side of the house painting in the living room. And I, um, my sister-in-law came in and popped her head and said, you know, there's some funny smoke down the road. And I said, I don't care. I'm, I'm going to continue painting because we had been evacuated twice before. Um, nothing came of it. So I, I just thought to myself, I'm going to keep painting. Um, however, I then popped my head out the door and what I saw was this. And I, I um, was very fortunate because my husband, our two sons and my sister-in-law were all home and everybody like, I, I think everybody just grabbed my paintings um, because I was working for this um, solo exhibition and I was only halfway there. Um, they knew how important it was that 
to grab my work, but of course they didn't grab things that would have been meaningful to them. And we lost all of my husband's sculptures. And um, it, it's hard to really describe um, the impact of this, uh, but we were not allowed to go back to our property until four days later. And we still thought maybe there's a chance that something is there. We didn't know. But by the time they let us back, um, the ground was still like smoldering. And this is our older son, Kalen. He's um, walking on the foundation of where I was painting. This was our living room. And this is probably our front door. This is my younger son, Evan. And um, his bedroom was actually above, he's actually in the basement level, but his bedroom was right above here. And he was looking for, you know, things that he thought might've survived the fire. And then um, my encaustic studio was, I don't know why some of these things survived because um, everything else just disappeared. It, it evaporated, but I collected these things from my encaustic studio and um, I still have them. I, in fact, I took a picture of it today. So um, I lost everything. I didn't have a single paint left, a single brush left, um, piece of paper. I lost a lot of art, but my family rescued, you know, the big pieces for my show. And I was lucky in that I was able to now rent this space. It's the Rocky Mountain Grange. Nobody was using it. And um, this is it today. Um, I had to, you know, insurance helped me a lot um, because otherwise I don't know what I would have done. Um, these are two works that I incorporated the ashes from our house into that were in the um, museum show. And I felt that, you know, I didn't have any equipment. So the first thing I got was a hot box. And then the next thing I do is made my own monotype waxes. And that's all I had. I couldn't really do the traditional encaustic because I didn't have the equipment, but I did have a hot box and I did have dry pigments, um, the ones I ordered. These are very like, um, there's not a lot of color. So I just had a few colors and I put in the, some of the ashes from our house into the wax. And um, I think that the work I did in this period of time, which was um, August, September, October, November, um, were they landed um, great meaning to this exhibition, which is now part of the catalog that I have that goes with the show. Um, in 2017, um, I continue to, you know, discover new things. Um, that's part of the, the, the fun thing about this medium or any medium is you continue to progress. And 2018, these are very tiny scale. I had never done anything this small. These are two by three inches. I guess it's not that small, but I started to play with collage material and um, kind of just incorporated some of the same techniques, but on a much smaller scale and found that to be really challenging. I don't know how many of you find that to be challenging, but I find that, um, you know, sometimes you start to work really large and then working really small becomes hard or maybe vice versa. Um, I, and I don't know about you, but I constantly try to like vacillate between the two so that I don't get too comfortable in any one size. This is a series of, these are just encaustic on paper. The paper is rice paper. And for me, monotypes are all about like mark making. They feel like a, a way of drawing. And so I guess that's one reason I love it is because it is mark making, but I found ways to um, actually make encaustic paintings out of these. So you mount them on a panel, you coat them with a couple layers of encaustic medium, and then you can buff them. And it's just a wonderful marriage between encaustic monotype and encaustic paintings. Um, here is just a grid uh, showing that I'm experimenting with um, various colors and designs and compositions. And like who doesn't love image transfer? Those of you on the call who happen to be acrylic artists, um, there's an art to it in any medium, but you can do it in encaustic and it's actually very similar to what you have to do with um, acrylic. These are some publications that I've been in. Um, this is Encaustic uh, Art Institute. Uh, and I was invited to uh, submit images for this um, magazine and I'm in the process of preparing another article for them. Uh, Just Jig was uh, a recent publication and I've been actually approached by their artists saying, hey, you know, is this a good magazine to be in? Um, and it was actually a gallery that found me through this magazine um, and invited me to be in their California gallery. So that, that was a nice outcome. And this is my um, Simply Not catalog. Uh, 2019, um, just more experimenting, but notice how um, my shapes are becoming clearer. My values are becoming clearer. I think my voice is becoming clearer. And I think this is all part of like 
um, understanding the medium, what it can and can't do, and then also understanding what it is I want from my art. Uh, these were little pieces of paper from Oaxaca where I taught in Mexico and we went to a paper factory and I brought home these necklaces that were all these little rec rectangles and I had to snip them off of the necklace um, and they were all different colors. But after you put them in the wax, of course I chose neutral colors, but um, I, I thought that was kind of a neat um, effect. Um, this is actually current. Uh, these shows, these pieces are currently at the Radius Gallery. And um, this piece, I was, I'm in love with this technique called intarsia because I've got these little tools that dig into the wax and it has to be at the right time. I'm um, just using a ruler here, but I had white encaustic paint underneath the blue. And when I pulled back the blue, um, sometimes it was really deep and sometimes it was really shallow. So I got all these variations in blue. This is a very this is monochromatic, right? There's only one color. But when there's white underneath it, you get a, a fluctuating value. And I'm, I'm actually really mesmerized by this impact. And I want to do a lot more paintings like this. This was where I worked in a series. So for those of you in my courses, um, I've got this acrylic course working in a series. Well, I'm a great believer in working in a series because um, it's efficient. It's, it helps you be productive. It helps you create a cohesive either show or grouping of paintings. I'm sure a lot of you have experienced that. These are all very small panels, but it was really a fun exercise. So how about you? Um, I was hoping that um, by, by seeing what I have enjoyed in this encaustic medium that perhaps, you know, I noticed that a lot of you specified, you know, you're new to encaustic or you're intermediate. Some of you are advanced, but I mean, how do you feel? Do you want to learn more about in this, this amazing medium called encaustic? Do you already love encaustic because you've tried it, but you want to learn more? Um, or do you want to be the very best encaustic artist that you can be? Um, I'm all three of those. I love encaustic. I want to learn more and I want to be the best encaustic artist I can be, right? So sure, but how can you learn all these encaustic techniques that, that I just talked about? It seems kind of overwhelming, right? Well, this is my surprise. I was just like asked by um, Laura Murphy and let's see, where is she in here? I haven't met her in person, but um, actually this, I believe this is her. <laughs> I apologize if I'm wrong, but I know that she, she's Irish and she is from um, Mulroney in Ireland. And she approached me and said, hey, we are gonna have this group of um, 26 world, world-class encaustic teachers. Would you like to join us? And I thought, okay. Um, so these are all the instructors who are putting together a masterclass for you. It's going to be a year long and it's going to be online. So don't worry about COVID, doesn't matter. You can stay home, you can watch your video 24 seven and every week of the year, starting April 30th, we get a new video from a new artist with a new technique. And I'm going to show you in the next slide that we are going to cover all these techniques and more. This is just like scratching the surface. But if you're interested in expanding your technical skills and I'm in that group, I don't think I'll ever not be in that group. And it's geared toward all levels. Okay, so this is a very special masterclass that um, Laura Murphy has put together. And she's called all these artists and you know, contacted us and like, what do you want to present? What, what is your specialty? So each artist has their specialty. Um, it's, you know, photo and caustic or monoprints, or maybe you play translucency off of opacity. Maybe it's sculptural, maybe it's assemblage, maybe it's mosaic, maybe it's color theory and value. So I'm not going to read through all these, but you get the idea. There are a lot of techniques that can be learned in encaustic. And one instructor, it's not good to learn from one instructor. It's good to cross pollinate and have a lot of instructors. Now, these are not just any instructors though. These are like the best in the world. Now you might think that this is going to cost an awful lot. So just hang in there. <laughs> good news um, because you're here on this call. So um, here's a list of all the artists. I put them in alphabetical order. And then this is all the work that's done. You know, each work is submitted by one of these artists. So you get a feel for sculptural, you know, bookmaking, um, there's collage, there's intarsia, there's assemblage, there's um, the accretion where you're building up these layers of wax. It just goes on and on. And I guess that's what you start to see. Wow, there's an awful lot that this medium can offer me, right? So early bird pricing, because you're here. 
it's only $199. I don't know if you guys are happy about that, but when I saw the price, I was like, seriously, <laughs> because, um, they were saying that if, if you were to go to all these studios or say, you know, take these lessons from 26 of the world's best in caustic artists, you're looking at $5,000. So I hope you're happy. Okay. <laughs> but it's not, that's not even it. Okay. So having the passion for teaching that I have and loving encaustic like I do, I was like, okay, that's, that's good, but let's make it better. Okay. So I'm going to throw in my brand new encaustic mini class for free. Um, I've been working on videos for the last like three or four months because I started to think this is before Laura even approached me and I don't, I was going to launch my own course. And then I thought, Hmm, now that she's asked me to be part of this group, why don't I just like give it to you for free? If you're going to sign up for this, this amazing um, masterclass, because here's the thing, if you're new, um, these are like world-class instructors. Now, I don't think they're going to actually teach you how to make encaustic medium. I don't think they're going to actually tell you how to set up your studio. Cause like they're going to be telling you about their expert technique. So I figured, I think that most people, even advanced artists can have a refresher on how do you make your own encaustic medium? Let me just tell you more about the mini course. So um, the new mini course for free, sign up at my website, encausticmasterclass.com includes full length videos um, available. Now this is important, it's available before the workshop begins on April 30th, because you don't want to start on April 30th and like not have anything ready to go. You want to have your waxes ready. You want to have your colors ready, your brushes. You need to have like um, your table set up. You need to understand that you had to go to the thrift store five times to get the right hot plates and griddles. So that's what this mini course is. How do you make your own encaustic medium? How do you make your own encaustic paints? There are two methods. What types of mark making materials to collect? Um, I can write a book on that. Comprehensive PDF listing suppliers for every single thing, really, that you'll ever need in your encaustic studio. How to care for your encaustic paintings. And there's a lot more stuff, but you know, I didn't want to like um, go on and on here. Plus, I figured, you know, if you're, I don't know where you live, but if you're like me, you're isolated. I live in a very small town and we kind of like to get on calls every now and then and compare notes and ask questions and and I don't know if there's going to be a Q&A with the um, master class, but I figured, why don't I, um, every few months, like schedule a Zoom call for anybody who has signed up at mas encausticmasterclass.com and answer questions, maybe do some demos and maybe have some additional workshops to go with this because I don't think we ever get enough training, especially during COVID. Um, so... Yeah. So anyways, I hope that you guys will jump for that opportunity. The, the masterclass begins on April 30th. All I can say is that if, after you've gone through my mini class, I really feel like you will be prepared. When I started in caustic, I, I really knew nothing. I tried to learn from a book. You can do that too. But for me personally, I feel like I need somebody to walk me through things and I need to ask questions. So maybe you're like that as well. So again, um, here is the website where you want to go. Each instructor is obviously going to be um, selling the, this um, masterclass. So it's very important that you use my link if you want my mini class. And all you will ever pay is $199. Um, I should mention that the masterclass price goes up to $249 after April 30th. Okay, and that's you know still a really, really good deal. So even if you miss out, you don't get the $199, the most you would ever pay for the masterclass alone, it's 249. And that is a really great deal. Um, so again, you must use my link, it's right here. Uh, so write that down or, you know, just don't forget that. It's pretty easy to remember though. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna like open up my beginner um, videos to you on March 1st, that's right around the corner. You're gonna have two months to prepare for the uh, masterclass, Essence of Malrani workshop. And I'd like to thank my two boys who are actually helping co-admin this call. Um, this presentation was energized by Vogue Superfood. Um, this is like my, my favorite product that is like, I don't often talk about it, but um, Vogue Superfoods is what keeps me going. Um, it's what got me through grad school because when I look back on those days, um, I 
had to drive an hour back and forth between Hamilton and Missoula and I was a terrible driver. I would get like highway hypnosis in an hour and I'd fall asleep. But this product um, gave me a nice energy that kept me from getting in car crashes and it keeps me awake. I used to take four hour naps every day. Um, and that's how I've been able to actually get things done. So here is a special coupon that they are offering for you guys. This is my company name. If you use Art and Success at BokeSuperfood.com, you'll get 25% off your first order. And I highly recommend this product. I don't want to take any more of your time, but I want to thank you all. Let me just stop sharing here. I know you have questions, um, but I'm not going anywhere. I'm still going to be around. <laughs> and um, believe me, for those of you who are in the mini class, I'm going to be calling uh, or sending you a link for our first get together on Zoom so we can get to know each other and uh, we will continue the conversation. Thank you so much, everybody. And I'm going to close the call now. I have a great rest of your evening and I hope to see you soon.